Hello. Welcome to Cliniversity. My slideshow is going to drop off. Yes, Banashree, please. Okay. please. Okay, so coming to the world of pharmacovigilance, welcome to all of you, right? So what is pharmacovigilance? If you ask me, I would say that in every aspect of our life, pharmacovigilance is there, okay? When we were in our childhood, okay, we used to ask our parents, like, can, can we do this? Can I go here? Can I go there? And uh, even if we didn't, okay, our... Uh, like parents used to say, don't do that, don't do this, don't go here, don't go there. And we used to have a question, why? Why not? We will go, we will do, okay? That was the curiosity within our heart, which used to work. Sometimes we used to get good, sometimes we used to get bad out of it, right? That curiosity should be always there, even in the pharma world. So most of you, maybe from bioscience background or from B farm, M farm and all. Okay, we got to know that this is the drug. That's it. In a plate that has been placed in front of us. But why it is, why it is what it is. Okay, the moment we get fever, we get paracetamol right in front of us. But why that is the only one? Why paracetamol? Okay, for fever. What is the back end story of it? Okay. How do we know that that will be suitable? How we will know that that will not be suitable for us? Okay, we need to investigate. Just getting the drug in our hand, in our plate is not enough. We need to scrutinize it. We need to investigate it. Okay, at the back end, we pharmaceutical companies, we do that part. Okay, to bring the ready-made plate service to you all. Okay, but now, from now on, you all have to do it. Okay, you all have to have that curiosity in your heart that why this drug, why not this drug? What are the good effects? What are the bad effects? So that is what is pharmacovigilance, to scrutinize the drug. Okay, just studying about the class, mode of action, mechanism of the drug will not do any good. We have to go and discover ourselves. Okay, we have to do the research part. We have to do the analysis part. And that is what pharmacovigilance talks about. Okay, so it is the science and it holds multiple activities within wherein we try to detect the link between the drug and the event. We try to understand how they are linked so that we can alarm everyone, including the public, that, hey, don't take if you're getting this. Take when you are getting that. Okay, and we can take the drug in proper time or we can guide others to take the drug on proper time. Okay, so this is about pharmacovigilance. When you scrutinize, when you study the drug in detail, when you analyze it. Okay. So aim of pharmacovigilance, that is to improve patient care. Obviously, see why we are discovering drug. Ultimately, to serve the patients, right, who are suffering from some of the other diseases. If the drug is unsuccessful in that, will it be of any use? No. So we have to do a proper research. We have to investigate the drug in such a way that it gives fruit, right? To keep track of the drastic effect of the drug, yes. We never know. Sometimes a drug can cause even a death. Sometimes the drug can be very, very beneficial. We never know it, okay? So that's why we need to study. Just studying the, you know, one part of the chapter, like in our old days, like, okay, this drug, this class, this is the mode of action, this is the side effect. How come those side effects came in? Who did that research? That we have to do it. Let's do that research by us, okay, by ourselves. Fine. Then to check the drug efficacy during and after the trial, right, to check the drug, the quality of the drug, the effect of the drug, okay, not only during the trial when we are trying it on patients, okay, on subjects, but even after that, when the drug is in market, in pharmacovigilance process, throughout the lifespan of the drug, we check its, you know, authentication. We check its purity. We check its effect. We check its good and bad aspects, okay? Pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic aspects, as I told you, 
how the drug is reacting to the body and how the body is reacting to the drug, this is something which we need to know to bring a better drug into the market, right? So that we can educate people and encourage the safe use of the drug. That's why pharmacovigilance is so important, okay? So that we can check the drug-drug interactions or various type of other effects of the drug, okay? The errors which can occur by wrong consumption of wrong dose, wrong frequency of the drug, so that we can get to know the variety of risks and the benefits which can occur altogether by the drug, pharmacovigilance is important. Wherein we take the drug, we do the research, we analyze the drug, various aspects of the drug we analyze. Okay, not only by doing the research, even after when we get the permission to market the drug, even after that, whenever we get cases from the public, we check the drug properties throughout. Okay, to get to know that what is this drug all about? Okay, so that always we can have a better drug into the market. So overall, if you see, why do we need pharmacovigilance? One is humanitarian ground, so that we can have a better drug for people's use, right? Then many drugs are there which can cause sudden death. You never know. Okay, variety of interactions, variety of reactions can lead to all these things. If we don't study, who will study for us? Nobody else, right? We have to study our drug, okay? We are from the science background. We hold that capacity. We hold that brain to, you know, study, investigate the drug in a better way. Okay, we should all have that curiosity within our heart. Hmm? Then promoting rational use of medicine and adherence so that we can tell others that, hey, use this one, don't use that one. If you have seen earlier days, okay, whatever doctors used to say, we used to believe. But now, have you observed that? That whenever you all go to the, say, chamber, okay, clinic and all, we do ask questions. Why, doctor? Why this one? Why not that one? Even that one is suitable, right? That has the same salt, right? So we question nowadays. As a result, doctors say that, yes, um, even that one is good. If it is suitable for you, it's okay. You can carry it. I bought some medication. So I went to the doctor again and I told that this is what I'm giving. Okay. So what the doctor did is he changed all the salts, I mean, all the drugs, which was not required, which was not required. Then I questioned that why this one? Why not this one? Because the issue is happening with the other one. So after a quick bit of conversation, he said that yes, you can carry on with this. Okay. Uh, but this one, I think that's the main problem. So you can just change this. I was like, yes, thank you. So what is helping out? What, what this is helping is in smart decision. Okay. Less cost effective dealings. Okay. Better judgment. So if you don't come into this track, how will you understand what the drug is causing? Right. So we have to educate ourselves and others about the various effects of the drug and how to use it, the rational use of the drug. Okay. And the last one, that is the ethics. Because we have to safeguard people, not harm others. Okay. So with that motive, we pharmaceutical companies always raise up in the discovery of the drug. Right? Okay. Now, when we talk about pharmacovigilance, it is not an easy path. Okay, or it was, I would say, not an easy path to come to the position where we are currently. A lot of bad history is attached to it. Okay, why, why I'm saying bad history? Because earlier, because of lack of proper research, unhygienic techniques, just somehow the drugs got to the market. Okay, as a result, it harmed a lot of people. Okay, if you see sulfonylamide tragedy, you might have heard about this one. Um, even in Google, you will get a lot of ads on this. Okay, what is this all about? There was a salt, that is the diethylene glycol salt, which was there in this um, medication, which was not suitable for the humankind. And as a result, so many deaths, including children, okay, they got victimized. 
Thalidomide disaster, if you see, okay, the company, when they produced this, they were so sure that they said that, hey, even a pregnant lady can consume this drug. And that one wrong statement caused havoc. FDA, when a lady doctor in FDA's chamber, she rechecked the documentary and she was the only one to say that, no, I want to recheck it. I think something is wrong. And because of her reinvestigation, and then she came up with the point that, no, this drug should be immediately halt. Okay, there has to be a halt. Fine, it should be banned. It cannot be used in pregnant ladies, right? And only because of her that after a few months, there was a ban to the drug. But by that time, already multiple ladies consumed it for treating their morning sickness. And as a result, when the babies were born, they were with lot and lot of lots of congenital anomalies. Right? Because of such type of tragedies and many more, okay, we had the evolution of our famous regulatories, FDA. Everybody knows nowadays, right? Even Siom's group by World Health Organization. Okay, so World Health Organization had a lot of responsibilities. Okay, so they created Siom's group, which is a non-profitable organization, to help in proper health research. Only for proper health research, the Siom's group was created. Okay, this working group was created. Okay, and as you all know, FDA today stands as the toughest regulatory to crack, right? We had a lot of acts and amendments coming up since the past. Okay, K fever Harris's amendment. The terms will be very new to you all. Okay, I agree with that. That's why I have not kept many. Okay, I've kept a few of the important ones here. So, K fever Harris's amendment came up when, especially because of this thalidomide disaster and all. Okay, to clearly say that, guys, stop, stop unethical practices. Stop the intention to somehow bring the drug into the market. No, we have to do proper animal study. Get a green signal that, yes, the studies are fruitful. Go with human study, get a proper approval for marketing, and then market the drug. OK? Declaration of Helsinki. That uh, This norm stands really healthy norms, I would say, for human research. Because Declaration of Helsinki was used to prepare our international guideline, that is, I see a GCP. Now let me tell you the story behind it. So in early days, um, all the countries were having their own set of guidelines. Okay, all the countries. But imagine, say suppose Dr. Reddy's. Everybody knows Dr. Reddy's, right? Say suppose Dr. Reddy's wants uh, their drug to be marketed in India, US, UK, I'll add two more, um, Australia and Canada. Okay. Now, if they have to market the drugs in so many countries, they have to do the research in all these countries to observe how this drug is reacting with the patients, right? And now to do the research in all these countries, they have to abide by the laws of all these countries, the norms and guidelines of all these countries. So imagine five research places, five different guidelines, okay? Confusion, time consumption, Resources required who can keep in their brain what they are doing, which for which country they are doing. So much of confusion. So to eradicate these confusion, slowly during the 1990s, okay, multiple countries joined hand together to decide on that why can't we have a common guideline, international level of guideline. And that's how ICH conference was held. Okay, International Conference of Harmonization was held to bring GCP, that is Good Clinical Practice Guideline. And that is now the international guideline which we all follow. Okay, Belmont report of those days clearly highlighted that we should respect people who are participating in the trial. That was the major problem. Okay, people were used as guinea pigs. Somehow the research was being done. Okay, drugs were published. To the market okay that was not the way out we should respect people we should give them justice right so that is what typically development report highlighted 
since then we had number of forms and i would say database launched okay forms um i have highlighted seom one form and medwatch form right i have mentioned here these are the forms which the companies use to capture the cases and then send them to the regulatory office okay you'll get to know more about when i'm talking right now coming to database yes database is something which you can experience okay with the pharmacovigilance practices to make you all understand in a layman way i would say database is like uh your emails how you use gmail yahoo mail and all right all these are e technology software tools which you use to pass on message from one portal to another right data from one portal to another imagine database is something like that it's a software portal where we store cases okay companies they use database to store cases regulators they use database to store cases okay multiple variety of reports when i say cases means multiple variety of patient reports right and then they are being stored they are being looked into from the back end we filter it out to analyze lot of details okay regulators they have the database to store data so that in the later stage they can pull out reports whenever required and they can analyze the drug characteristics so that's how important database is the database which i have mentioned here aers that is adverse event reporting system database and european eudra vigilance database these are the very huge storage portals which the regulators have okay so us have aers database and europe has eudra vigilance now there is again a story behind earlier companies used to have database then the regulators decided that okay ultimately companies are reporting to us all the cases and we either by a mail or something we are receiving them but we don't have our own database so we are storing them in hard copy format and all like old fashion and there are chances that you know we can get catch fire okay earthquake can happen and we can lose all this data so why can't we have database so that's how after long planning because database for regulatory need to have huge capacity right so after long planning the these two database okay finally came up us have their own database europe has their own database okay the major two big markets fine yes so in this long journey of our history let's talk about india if you ask me india from past okay had a heritage of knowledge education okay vedic education and all right but because of so many capturing countries they took away our major assets that is the educational part i would say okay but never mind we are still at a good phase and we are growing so india to bring them into a recognition recognizing stage what they did is india joined who upsala monitoring center now you'll be thinking what is upsala monitoring center when the corona time was there i don't know how many of you have watched if you have watched the television so many times upsala monitoring center was coming into picture so many times now what is that generally what happens all the pharma companies how they are working that is being looked into by the regulators of each country but how the regulators and the pharma companies are working in each country that is being looked into by the world health organizations upsala monitoring center they keep a third eye vision to check how the regulators are functioning what type of drugs are getting discovered what are the major effects and side effects and all right now india joined this team in 1997 as a result what happened india got a recognition that hey yes india is also an important country which produces very good drugs right during those days that this pharmacovigilance technique okay that is the so called high fi properly organized technique of research was not there in india we were doing research we were discovering good drugs but this technique was not there okay 
slowly, by the time of, I would say, roughly, you can say 2005, okay, National Pharmacovigilance Program was launched in India. World Health Organization was there to help. Sedesco was there. Okay, Government of India was there all together. And it is during this time that pharmaceutical companies started understanding the importance of pharmacovigilance. Slowly by, you know, 2010, almost I would say every pharma company, they realized the importance of pharmacovigilance, the stepwise standardized processing of research, okay, and every, every pharma company started following. If you see today, we follow Schedule Y, which is Indian guideline, and we follow international guideline, that is ICGCP, okay, to stand at the international levels. Okay, if in case you all have any queries, part them, jot them down somewhere, okay, keep it, because at the end, it will be easy so that we can discuss all the points together, okay? Coming to the drug discovery phase, okay, if you, the, the picture which you can see in the screen, that is the entire drug discovery phase. Okay, it's a long journey. Some drugs take 10 years, some can take 15 years plus also, right? So what we do during this drug discovery? So first of all, say suppose there is a viral attack on my hand. Just giving a layman example, okay? Don't take it anyways, okay? So suppose a viral attack on my hand. Hmm? So the virus is injecting in my normal cells, infecting them, right? Now what I have to do? I have to find out a chemical component which will go and either bind to the protein strain and stop their growth, or they will bind to the normal cells to prevent the protein strain and their attack. Either of the two ways can we can do, right? This process is called as lid and hit mechanism, with which we can try to, we, I mean, like, you know, we try to find out the appropriate component which will go and bind and stop the further viral attack or the growth. Now, this is the first stage of drug discovery. Once we have got the appropriate one or two chemical components, then we start with animal testing. Okay, now I might sound rude, but we take either the cells of the animals or the organs or the entire body of the animal to investigate a lot of factors like toxicity. Okay, so when we inject the drug, right, how much time it is taking to get absorbed, metabolized, and then excreted? how it is affecting the body and how the body is reacting to the drug. Is it giving toxic effect? Is it causing any type of mutation leading to cancer? Is it causing genomic level of you know changes? Fine. Any other effect? What is the appropriate dose which is actually suitable in the animal body? All these things we check. And then we give this report to the regulatory to get the next step agreed upon, that is human trial. Now, in human trial, as you can see, we have three phases. Those are the standard ones. But there is also one phase, which is called as phase zero. So if the drug experiment is very critical, like this corona situation, wherein we didn't get much of the patients, right? And the situation was very, very critical. What we did, we did pilot studies. Okay, we did small sample studies, very small sample studies, to bring out the drug profile, right? So if you do small sample studies or say if you are discovering a drug for a critical illness and all, we basically include patients, never the healthy volunteers. Okay, fine. For otherwise and all, for general uh, drug discoveries and all, we do include healthy volunteers, but not for any type of critical ones. Now, as we go higher up in the phase studies, our patient population increases so that we can target major amount of patients to understand how the body is reacting to the drug and how the drug is reacting to the body, how the bo drug is getting absorbed, metabolized, and excreted. What is the appropriate dose? Okay, does the drug have the capacity to cause toxicity, delayed reactions or toxicity, right? Any type of mutation or carcinogenicity? So all these things which we have studied in the animals, in detail we study in the humans now. And that is not the end. Once we submit all these reports after phase three study to the regulatory, okay, we jump into phase four observations, wherein 
after releasing the drug into the market, I would say that's the main thing now, the main time now that we investigate the drug more, you know, elaborately. Okay, so we do phase four studies. And once our phase four observation studies are over, so basically we observe the drug, right? That how it is, how it is working, whether it is giving good effect or bad effect, okay? Even we observe the patients who earlier were there in the trial. That is the drug capable of giving delayed reactions in, the, in those bodies? Okay, so we check all these things. And once we have the satisfied results, we then calmly release them into the market. Means leave them into the market. But that is not the end. Okay, we still insist people that whenever you are facing any difficulty, please report. And that's how we get spontaneous reports. Okay, so that is again another phase. So why am I explaining you this phase? Because pharmacovigilance is not restricted to one phase. Throughout the drug discovery, whenever we get cases, we try to scrutinize that case, scrutinize the drug properties okay understand the drug properties in a better way and that is what is pharmacovigilance okay that is investigating the drug throughout its lifespan starting from research till the end of that drug okay every time coming to the next slide yes so where from we will get cases to judge the you know, a drug in a better way. Where from we will get cases? So one, as you can see, if you see from the top clockwise, we will go one by one. So clinical trials, yes, when we do research, okay, we uh, check the patients, we counsel the patients, we look into the pa patients that what type of disease uh, events, issues that they are getting, right? So clinical trials, post marketing, that is phase four observations when we do. We observe the patients who were earlier in the trial, we observe uh, patients who are, who are now taking the drug, okay, we follow them up to see if they are getting any events. So variety of observations we do, right? Then we have spontaneous reporting. So once we leave the drug calmly into the market, suppose any other person is taking, public people, I mean, you know, public members are taking, and then they are coming back with their uh, data, okay? Then we are again scrutinizing the drug based on the cases which we are receiving, Okay, so we get cases from these sponta spontaneously from the doctors, from the patients. Okay, literature articles. When you students, okay, say medical students or members from PhD group and all, they start doing medical thesis, right? You all might have done projects. Okay, same way, uh, groups are there who does medical thesis and all by taking drugs. Okay, the drugs which are freely available in the market, right? So they take up the drugs, they do their variety of research, and they publish their articles. Now, pharma companies, they keep an eye, okay, into such discoveries. They see that, okay, what is new about our drug? Who has studied our drug? Is there any critical finding? Is there any new finding from our drug? So they keep an eye. And as a result, they capture these articles. Okay, they capture these articles, they analyze these data that how come our drug is involved in it. And then they give the report to the regulatory. That regulatory, see, this is our drug and this has caused good effect or bad effect, whatever it is, okay, be transparent. So those are called as literature articles. Then multiple small, small, you know, clinic research units, they are in contract with the big pharma companies, okay. So with the big pharma company, multiple research units, they are always in, in, in contract basis that they work. They observe the variety of drugs which are being launched by the pharma company or on, who, on which the pharma company is working. And if they see anything upside down, any other observations that they get, okay, they immediately inform that, hey, fellow, we got this type of cases. Okay, I think it will be important for you to jot down. So they supply. Okay, because we are getting from these contractual bodies, we name them as contractual agreement cases. Regulatory authority cases, yes. Now, if you ask me, I have a friend of mine, okay, in regulatory's office. So instead of reporting to the pharma company, what do I do? I report to my friend. And they 
whatever cases, it's not my case only, whatever cases they get, they investigate at their end and they reach back to the company. We have internet or digital media from where we can get a lot of cases. We get nowadays, right? Everybody with blogs and all they will publish. So all these actually helps us to get variety of cases to know the drug in a better way. So once we get the cases, what do we do? We first collect them, okay? Being in the company, we first collect them, okay? Then we do the data entry in the database. Okay, so we have electronic database portal, fine, wherein we enter all this data. We analyze them, okay, causality assessment is, we analyze them. That is it because of our drug? No, some other reason and all. So we analyze the case in a better way. And everything goes on in the electronic portal, that is the database, okay? And then we report this data to the regulatory. We store it, okay? And a copy of it via the forms which I showed you, okay, SIOMS and MedWatch forms, fine. I mean, like the one which I was talking about, we send the data to the regulatory, fine. So that is one part we do. Also, the data which we have stored at the back end, okay, I mean, like the database, we pull the, those data at regular intervals, say after six months, after one year, we pull those data. And we prepare big summary reports, okay to show the regulatory that throughout the year, this is what we have received. These are the good effects of the drug. These are the bad effects of the drug, right? And we submit those huge reports again to the regulatory. Those are called as aggregate reports, okay? Very valuable reports, all of them, okay? Single cases, aggregate reports, and then signal detection. With the help of data storage in our database, okay, and regular interval data pull from the back end, we actually find out that what are the new spark, what are the new events that we have noticed, which we have never identified earlier. Okay, now for example, you all know that metformin is good for diabetes, correct? But metformin have been discovered in multiple places that it is good for ovarian cancer. It is good for PCOD, cystic issues. Now imagine if nobody would have ever watched or observed these signals, we would have never come to know, right? So this backend data portal, which are available, okay, when we go and scrutinize this backend data portal, we get to know that, okay, in this one year, in the six months, in this two year, what are new events that we have discovered which is occurring from the drug? Maybe good events, maybe bad events. I mean, like maybe the good effects or the bad effects, right? So this database portal helps us to analyze lot many factors. Signal is the various type of these parks, so the new things which we have never observed earlier, which might be that we have observed within the six months happening with our drug, okay, or one year happening with our drug, right? So these are various things which we can detect with the help of data storage, with the help of this pharmacovigilance process, okay? Even at the regulatory end, when they store data at their database, they store it for later scrutiny so that later half they can pull that data out, okay, and they can statistically analyze that how authentic it is and how much, you know, good effects or the bad effects the drug can cause. To, so to analyze the drug in a better way, right? So pharmacovigilance is really, really required. And it is just not one process of capturing data giving to the regulatory, no. It is a huge technique of analyzing the drug, okay, in all possible ways. Okay, what all things that we can observe when we do pharmacovigilance? We can observe various side effects that the drug can cause, toxic effects, okay, any type of allergy we can de detect, okay, any carcinogenicity, okay, drug induced diseases and all, if they are occurring, we can detect them. Any special scenarios? Now, this is very interesting. Okay. Any special scenarios? For example, I'll give you a quick example. Okay. One day my mom was really sick and uh, she told me to bring her normal drug, which she generally consumes because that was not there at home. I went to the shop and I, but that particular brand was not there. So I brought the same salt, but of a different brand. Okay. And I gave it to her. She was not happy with me. She was very angry. She told that, don't bring uh, this change drug, okay? Bring me up my own drug. 
and I was like, okay, fine, this is all the same. And believe me, okay, it was effective on her. She was fine after a few hours, okay. But then I got the scolding, what to do? So what was happening with her is drug dependency. Because of constant use of the drug, okay, more than physical, psychological effect of hers. Now, this is not exactly an event, but it is equivalent to that. So these we term in our pharmacovigilance world, we term them as special scenarios, okay, or special events, fine? And these things should be reported once we notice. Medication error. If anybody, like say doctor, nurse, patient, while dispensing, administering the drug, if they have done anything wrong, okay? So say, suppose um, the medication should have been given by hand, it has been given in the hip region, right? It should have been consumed orally, okay? But it was being, say, orally, directly, okay? But that was not done. Fine. It was being given, say, by IV route, okay? Some other route, fine, or something, disaster which might have been done. Unknowingly, not intentionally, unknowingly. Then those will come under medication error, okay? Withdrawal syndrome, especially with neurological drugs, we have observed this that um, whenever the body gets detached from the habituated drug components, neurological drug components, okay, the reverse type of action or reaction occurs. Like people can go under, you know, depression. They can have suicidal tendencies. A lot many things can occur. This is very dangerous, right? So it is advised that do not stop the drug immediately. Go with a very slow withdrawal. Right. So these all, if you see, these are not exactly events. Hmm? Off label use. Yes. I have seen many people using Comiflem for everything. Okay. Even one of my brother does that. Okay. For any type of pain, even if fever is occurring or something, okay, you will just use Comiflem. Now, see, for Pain, it is okay, but you should know for what actually you are using. For even like, you know, he is having that acidic problem, he will use uh, comiflem. Okay, even if he is having pain, he will use comiflem. Okay, he is having fever, no body pain. Okay, just fever, like a bit of temperature high, comiflem. Okay, for everything, he will have comiflem. So that is not correct, right? That is off label use. When you are using a drug for an indication for which it is not meant to be taken. Okay, drug exposure during pregnancy or lactation. So during lactation or pregnancy, most of the drugs we are not supposed to take. Now, if a lady is getting exposed to it, we should report. Now, why, why, why we should report? You will think, right? Because the company follows up with uh, such members to check if the baby is fine, because it's their responsibility too, right? Okay, accidental exposure. Now, in India, the main part is we don't report. Because many people doesn't have idea about pharmacovigilance. Okay, pharmacovigilance is a far topic. I would say they don't have idea about the drug properties, right? So how can they report about accidental exposure and all? If you go to the Western countries, even for silly minor things, even if their pets got exposed to the drug somehow, you know, they kept it on the table and the pet drank it off, okay, or threw it or, you know, galloped it. Okay, they will immediately report, right? They will immediately report, fine. Product quality issue. Many a times we have seen the lid is open, expired product, this and that. But do we report? No, but they should be reported. Okay, if you check other countries, okay, the number of drugs which get withdrawn from the market, banned from the market, see so high it is, okay? So that's why if you go to the Western countries, they have the best and the best of the drugs available. Because everybody reports, everybody is alarmed. Okay, so pharma companies are on their toes. They don't, I will not create any wrong drug. I have to be perfectly correct and all. Okay, and they create the good ones. Here in India, what we are doing is we are lagging in this part. Okay, we should understand the importance of pharmacovigilance. It is a very big portal. We have to analyze the drug and everybody should in, you know, indulge themselves. 
everybody should report. If patients don't report, pharma companies, how they will do their work, how they will analyze it. So we have to analyze it, right? Yes. We have dictionaries. Till now, I think when you have seen dictionaries, you have seen the, you know, normally your Hindi to English and vice versa dictionaries in your school days. In pharmacovigilance, okay, in database, we have softwares, okay, that is dictionaries in the software pattern which are there, inbuilt. Okay, very interesting to study, right? These dictionaries, if you see Medra dictionary, which was being created during the time of ICH GCP creation, that is international guideline creation. And what is the dictionary all about? It is used to code various type of disease terms, various type of conditions, signs, symptoms, okay, surgeries, investigations, and all. Now you will say that uh, do we don't have any dictionary to code even drugs and all? Yes, we have. That is the WHO dictionary. Okay, so WHO has discovered a drug dictionary which is used to code purely the drug and the device names, the active names, the salts, the generic names, okay, everything, brand, generic names, okay, the vaccines, the dietary supplements, herbal remedies, everything we can code with the help of this dictionary. Fine. So these are highly effective dictionaries. In one go, in such a short span of time, it will not be possible to explain you the interesting part of this but I'm trying to highlight as much as possible as I told you. These are very, very effective software tools which we can utilize, play with, analyze, look into, okay, and explore our knowledge, okay, explore our knowledge. Because when you see Who Dictionary, just not the name, it highlights the company who has discovered that drug, okay, and in which country it is being sold. So vast information you get through these dictionaries. Right, and these dictionaries are used, they are already embedded in the database. The database where you capture per case, where you analyze per case. Okay, so see, pharmacovigilance is just not capturing one case, it is a huge portal where we get a lot of opportunities to analyze the drug in a better way. Okay, so I'm sure you all might have the question in your brain that okay, fine, what type of job we can crack through? So multiple jobs are there. If you see drug safety operations, case processor, case reviewer, okay, drug safety team lead, manager, directorship, and all that will come obviously one by one, not at first go. Okay, but at the initial stage, if you will ask me, yes, collecting cases, very important. Now you don't have to go anywhere to collect cases. Cases will come to you in the company. Okay. There are various portals, various techniques with which we collect cases. You have to capture those cases into the database, analyze them, okay, with the real world evidences which you are getting, okay, capturing them and then transferring them into the forms with the help of which we transfer them further to the regulatory. Also, if you are expertise in this field, you can create or help the companies create standard operating procedures, okay, SOPs, norms okay, for their pharmacovigilance executions, right? Even you can read through multiple articles to explore your knowledge, okay, screen through. If you particularly observe the surveillance part, okay, risk management, signal detection, review of multiple cases. Signal detection is just not an easy step. It is a very, very knowledgeable step, detailed, vast, you know, field it is wherein we try to check what is new from the drug that we got to know this year or this tenure okay so we get to know a lot of risk we get to know a lot of benefits we get to know a lot of sparks coming out from the drug okay so you can uh, if you see the professional world you can get into as pv scientist you can get into drug safe as a drug safety physician okay even uh, medical reviewers and all Okay, you can go for that, especially doctors. Okay, for them, these positions are really widely open. Okay, system, yes. In pharmaceutical company, we deal with a lot of database. Each project will be handled with a variety of database. Okay, like one project, 
dealt with in one particular database. Okay, operations happening in that. Another project might be that it is going on in another database. If you ask me, uh, in my lifespan, I have worked with almost uh, almost seven, roughly, you can see database. Okay, leaving apart regulatory database. That is totally different. That is for regulatory use. Okay, I'm talking about just the companies. Okay, so you can work on multiple databases. You can explore your knowledge in that. Okay, you can play with the dictionaries. You can get information like what to say. It's a huge portal. Okay, QPPV, that is Qualified Persons for Pharmacovigilance and Pharmacovigilance Officers in Charge. You can work like that. Now, to get a job as per QPPV operations are considered, you have to be really, really qualified one in pharmacovigilance. They are pharmacovigilance experts. Okay, they act as the middleman between the organization and the regulatory to carry the issues, the queries, okay, from the organization level to the regulatory and bring out the solution, resolution norms from the regulatories and to the pharma company so that they can properly run through with the research process. Okay, so they act as the middleman. Obviously, everybody from the company cannot knock the door of the regulatory, right? Regulatory will go mad isn't it? So QPPV acts as the middleman, walks to the regulatory's office, talk to them, get a solution, comes back and gives the solution to the company. Okay, so people who are looking for QPPV job, you have to be really expertise in pharmacovigilance. You should be thorough with the pharmacovigilance norms, you should be thorough with the regulatory norms and all. Right? So, so many job opportunities you have in the organization. And you won't believe in our time, all this so vast thing was not there. Okay, so vast. Uh, I would say uh, people, uh, I mean, companies at that time was booming up with the knowledge of pharmacovigilance during our times. You all are lucky enough that you all have such you know, training centers and all to provide you the learning session, to provide you the meaning and understanding of what is pharmacovigilance. Okay. So to give you an overview, so drug safety, pharmacovigilance, okay, it helps us to properly scrutinize the patient cases as and when we receive them, whether from clinical trial or we are receiving it from the post-marketing atmosphere from the public, okay, we scrutinize them, we analyze them properly to bring out the points, bring out the effects, bring out the risk and benefit profile of the drug in a better way. Okay, in none of the other profession you will get to uh, get these facilities wherein you can actually go deep and take a deep drive of the drug characteristics to get to know the drug in a better way. Right? So whenever, generally, if you see, whenever we get cases from clinical trials or we get cases from the um, post-marketing atmosphere, okay? Now you will be wondering that how we get cases from the post-marketing uh, mm, you know, scenario because from clinical trial, doctors are there, investigators are there at the site to take care of the patients. And if anything is wrong, they can observe the cases and give to the company. Fair enough. In the post marketing world, whenever you uh, pick up any drug, okay, you might have gone to chemist, right? Lot many times, and you have picked up any drug, you will turn that. Term that at the back, you will see that, you know, for any emergency or for any reason, please call up this, this, this. They will give a toll-free number. Okay. You can fax. You can give a call. Okay. You can email the pharma company and all. So with those portal, the company gets to know about the various side effects or various type of good or bad effects that the patients are suffering from. Okay. From them, we capture those cases into the database. We analyze them. Okay, we scrutinize them that it is, is it because of the drug that all these things have happened? And we give the report to the regulatory. Serious cases are reported prior. Okay, non serious cases, depending upon the norms of the country, they are reported a bit later. 
sometime at the year end when we are gathering all the cases together and reporting at that time we report serious non serious together again okay we discuss with the regulatory we come to a conclusion that okay this drug is really good for the market this drug is bad for the market whatever it is okay if there is a requirement see pharmacovigilance portal is so strong that if there is a requirement we based on regulatory's decision and all we can pull back the drug we have to pull back the drug right so without pharmacovigilance without drug assessment any drug if you see will be there in the market for life long there will be no judgment being taken right so that's why pharmacovigilance is very very important for more details connect us on given details on screen and don't forget to follow us on our social media thank you